Right? In other words, that is 1 if i is equal to j, and it's 0 otherwise, right? So the finite sum here just becomes what? c j equals to 0. But j is arbitrary, therefore the set of n coordinate derivations is linearly independent, hence a basis for the tangent space. So. All right, I guess that's part of it. What else did I claim? Oh, I also claimed that we have a really nice way to calculate the components of a vector with respect to this basis. How do you do it? Right? I'm like, okay, so V is, so if I let V act on F, how's it go? Well, let me, let me just try it out. Suppose you've got V is equal to a sum of CI partial partial XI at P, right? Why can I do this? And my apologies, I'm writing sums again. I'm trying to like, <laughs> I'm trying to follow Lee and use the repeated index convention, you know? But I, I kind of phase in and out of it, all right? If in doubt about this for something in the book, ask me, I'll tell you, okay? I speak physics. So this is a vector. How can we calculate CI? Same thing as the proof of linear independence, right? Act on XJ. So V of XJ is equal to a sum of CI partial XJ partial I, right? But, the, but this right here is the Kronecker delta, which makes this sum collapse to just, and my bad, I really have to put the upper I on this to be consistent with the conventions. That should be C upper I. So what we find then is that the C upper I has to exactly be V of XJ, right? And maybe I should have written C upper, I should have written, I really should have written V upper I to start with anyway. That's the notation, right? See that? If the vector is VI, summed over partial i, see this guys? vi partial i, then this, which I've called ci down here, is equal to v acting on xi. So to calculate the components of a vector with respect to the, the derivation basis, very simple, you just act the vector on the coordinate functions of the basis. Simple as that. Right? Are, we, are you guys with me? Yeah? Okay. What's that? Mostly? 90%? Okay. I'll take 90%. I'll even take like 5%. I'm going to go on. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I hope you understand something about what we're doing. Yeah. That definitely is a CJ. Thank you. J is fixed but arbitrary. I is an index of summation there. The, uh, the J survives. The I does not. All right, so we can do, uh, you know, we can do more here, all right? Let's think about these things a little bit more. So what's the deal? If it's a smooth manifold, there's also a transition function, right? From this to there, from, from here to there, right? And that is what? We got X bar composed with what? X inverse, right? Okay, and um, I think I can safely erase, I'm going to erase these things, you guys are going to remember them for me, right? Okay. But if we can do it for the X coordinate system, we can do it for the barred coordinate system just the same, right? Like, if I pick a vector up here, v, I can just as well write v as equal to v, um, you know, v of xi partial partial xi at p, or I could write v of x bar i partial 
partial, you know, x bar i at p, right? And so this we could also denote as vi partial partial xi at p. Well, that's equal to v bar i partial partial x bar i at p, right? But these are the same vector. It's just different representations of the vectors, either with respect to the the x coordinate system or the x bar coordinate system. Yeah. Now let's see here. So we can we can kind of envision we can envision um, you know up here we can actually kind of picture like partial partial x i at p is, is is in the tangent space up there, right? So one of the things we might calculate is the push forward. Think about this, guys. The push forward of this guy down to here. What would the push for? How would we push that coordinate derivation back down there? How would that go? What would that look like? So, what would you say? Applying x. Applying x, yeah, something like that. So dx at the point p, right, of partial partial xi at the point P, right? Down to here. Feed it a function down here. Like a smooth function, let, you know, f, uh, let f be an element of C infinity Rn. Right, this is Rn, right? So what's our definition? Oh, see, now I'm going to get into trouble. Um, this is the same issue I was running into my previous example, right? Because it's not, a, when, when it's a real valued map, it's easy to write down. Like, let me write something down that's easier. Like, if I just said, uh, the, let's say the, um, the, the, jth compor let's, the, the jth component function here, right? Like, x, x upper j is a mapping from u into r. Um, <sighs> fine. Now, if I, if I was to do that, then this is literally, um, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I've lost my place. Let me, let me stop this. Let me stop this. But I should be able to, I'm not saying what I was saying was wrong, I just, I, I don't know where I'm going, right? And I don't, I don't want to mess it up too much. What I should be able to prove to you guys is that if we were to define the, uh, the coordinate derivations down here, right? Like this, partial, say partial u i at p, and I'm, I'm, I'm using Cartesian coordinates u1 through un down there. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure what I should be able to argue once I sort things out correctly is that the differential of x at the point p, it's going to push partial, partial x sub i at p down to partial, partial u at i, uh, u sub i at what point? At down here, x of p. All right, that, that's what it does actually. Now, let me write down a formula that Jeff Lee has in his, Jeff, Jeff, yeah, John Lee has in his book here. Here it is. He has the following. He says, partial, partial xi at p is equal to d phi p inverse of partial, partial x i at phi of p, which is equal to d of phi inverse at phi of p of partial, partial x i at phi of p. And furthermore, unwinding definitions, he says partial partial xi at p acting on f is 
equal to partial partial xi acting at phi of p of acting on f composed with the inverse. All right, and that is nothing more than partial f hat, partial xi acting on p hat, where f hat is equal to f composed with phi inverse. And that's the, he says the local coordinate representative of f and p hat, which is equal to um, p1 pn is equal to phi of p. All right. So let me demystify things a little bit further here um, for, for, for John Lee. And we're on page 60 here at the moment. This x is literally, he's calling this, uh, uh, this x phi, all right? That's his notation. So he says you can make an identification is what he says. He makes this identification. Uh, and what's his identification? His identification is essentially this, is that you can use, he, he thinks that basically he's advertising that taking the derivative with respect to the coordinate chart up there is equivalent to taking the partial derivative down here of the local, rep of the representation, the coordinate representation of the function. The function's not pictured here, all right? Um, if I wanted to clutter my picture, I could, add a real line over here and we can look at the fun fine I will here's the real line our function does something like this right f hat is like that f hat is um, phi inverse do 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 composed with f do 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 all right so f hat is a function from x of u to R, it's a real valued function there, so you can, you can differentiate that. Now, but you notice that he uses partial partial xi both up here and down here. I don't know, I'm not convinced that's the best thing for starting students. I think it's good to have a different notation for the coordinates up here versus the coordinates down here. So I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with this way of thinking, right? Now, I haven't proved to you that this is what happens, all right? And um, I think I've got some kind of mental block about that right now. So I'm not going to go back to that. I'm going to save that for like making a little video. I'll prove just this alone in the video, okay? So, but let's talk about, yeah. Should it be like um, in the front, dx to the i? So no. No, I mean that this is the whole coordinate chart. See, x, x, x is itself a mapping from, from u to, you know, rn. So dx maps from the tangent space to u, which is the tangent space to, you know, tangent space to m at the point p to the tangent space to rn. Um, so if you look at this, all right, so like let's, let me just like, this is, these equations I have written, this is a direct copy out of John Lee's chapter, page 60, right? I want to show you where he's making the identifications in terms of my UI notation, all right? So like d phi inverse, right? D phi, phi inverse goes like this, right? So the thing he's feeding into it is actually this guy. So this in my notation would be partial partial ui at phi of p, okay? That's all I'm saying, that's basically all I'm saying. I just want to point out to you that he is, and he says it, he's very clear about it, he's making an identification. And he's gonna use that identification and it's going to streamline calculations and we're gonna come along, we're gonna come along to his way of thinking eventually for the sake of not going nuts with calculations. But I think at the start, it's helpful to make a distinction between these concepts. These guys, derivations on smooth functions of Rn. These guys, derivations on smooth functions of the manifold. These are not the same thing. Um, yeah. And, oh man, my picture is super busy now. But uh, it's 
So that's one thing. Let's talk about coordinate change. <clears throat> All right, so I guess I got to give up on this picture now. I'm going to go on to another board. Fine. Man, this board is just not good. <laughs> I mean, it seems slippery, but it, it just it, it absorbs the markers or something. It's weird. <laughs> you say num num. Num 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 num. <laughs> I'll allow it. Oh, thank you. Muchos gracias. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> we have coordinate change. Let me do this. So on the one hand, we have V is VI right? Um, partial, partial xi, right? But at the same breadth, we can write it v bar i, partial, partial x bar i, right? Maybe I should use a different index over here. Let me use a j. Oh, let me not. Sorry, guys. I'll make up my mind eventually. So my question is simply this. How are the components related? How are the components related for the u versus the u bar coordinate system. What do you guys think? So we can figure it out by just taking this equation and acting on the coordinate function. Act on like what? Let's act on xj. What happens? Actually, let us act on x bar j to be more interesting. x bar j partial xi, you know, at the point p is equal to v bar i partial x bar j partial x bar i at the point p, right? But this, Kronecker delta ij, so we just get v bar upper j here, right? And lo and behold, that's the rule. So to change coordinates on a vector, we simply um, do the following, like v bar j is equal to partial x bar j partial x i v I. That's the, that's how you change coordinates on a vector at a point over a manifold. Just that. Simple as that. It's actually kind of embarrassing if you think back to linear algebra, coordinate change was harder there, wasn't it? <laughs> you know? Think about it. Maybe I should teach this in linear algebra to make coordinate change seem easier. What do you think? <laughs> probably, probably not, right? Um, all right, so then the thing I keep wrestling with a little bit today is what does the differential look like in coordinates, right? So let's get that, let's get that done. So if we have F, a mapping from M to N, all right? And um, so here, I'm going to write the formula here. I'm going to put the picture over here. So here's my M, here's my N. All right, so I got a point P here. I've got my point F of P over here. My mapping goes like this, right? I've got a coordinate chart X here. I've got a coordinate chart Y over here, all right? And so down here, I've got, you know, um, our, uh, let's say M, and over here, because of my choice of letters, R, N, right? Then to say this is a smooth map means what? The local coordinate representative of the mapping is smooth, right? So down here we got what? We got F hat, as he calls it, and that's equal to what? That's uh, F goes in the middle, Y comes last, so we do Y composed with F. 
composed with x inverse. There you go, that's the local coordinate representative of the map. All right? And um, how, do we, how do we define, well, we, we defined the differential already, right? I wrote it at the start of class, I think. Oh, here it is, still here, right? This is the definition of the differential, but how does that actually look in terms of coordinates is the question. All right, so here's, the, here's how that goes in coordinates. The differential of f, all right, <clears throat> if we map the um, partial partial xi, all right, then that is equal to, um, let's see, how does that go? Um, the sum, j equals 1 to, I, I just can't stop writing sums, I'm sorry guys. Um, <laughs> sum j equals 1 to n, and here this is at p of course, all right. So I guess there's a sub p here too. But what we got is we've got the partial derivative of y upper j composed with f partial xi, right? And that's all at the point p. And then times partial partial y j, and those are assigned to the point f of p. That's actually in coordinates how the differential works. And um, so if you really study it, if you, and if you drill down into what, if you drill down into how this is defined, right, this is nothing more than like the Jacobian matrix. This is the Jacobian matrix of the local coordinate representative when you sort through this. So sometimes when I calculate the differential, I actually use this to do it, all right? Now, one of your homework problems is to prove the chain rule for the composition of smooth manifold maps. Yeah, I have proved that in this formalism with Ernesto like yesterday. It took me an hour or a half hour, I forget. It took a long time. It was not, it, I mean, it can be done. I can share with you the scan of that, right? I actually sort, we actually did is we actually took the question of the chain rule up on manifolds and we brought it back down to the corresponding question of the chain rule um, on Euclidean space. And then we know the, Euclid the chain rule on Euclidean space, so then we can lift the chain rule from Euclidean space back up to the manifold. You can actually, if you can suffer through the notation, do that. But there's a way easier way. <laughs> so that brings me to the end of um, skipping past, oh, oh man. Skipping past the tangent bundle momentarily. We're going to circle back to the tangent bundle today. Don't worry. Um, I'll get it, get it covered here. Um, but um, past the tangent bundle, there is just a page on what's called the velocity vectors of curves. So let's, you know, that, that's actually a pretty easy idea. <laughs> For physics. So here's the, the definition. Um, for um, a gamma, a mapping from J, which is a subset of the reals, all right, to the manifold. Um, you define velocity, velocity of, of gamma at uh, T naught is gamma prime of T naught but what is gamma pre t, gamma prime of t naught is defined to be the differential of gamma, all right, acting on d dt at t naught. And that, my friends, is an element of the tangent space at gamma of t naught of m. All right. Now, there are, there more, I mean, so the question then is how does this actually act? I mean, it's a derivation, right? The velocity vector is a derivation. How does that actually sort out? Like, how does that work? So how do you, how do you really understand a derivation? What do you gotta do? You need to let it act on a function. How does this act on the function? So like um, gamma prime 
of t naught acting on a function is um, given by what? How do you actually do that? It is d, uh, so let me just write it out, d gamma of d dt at t naught acting on, so I haven't really, I haven't really said anything yet. How, how does this define? Do you guys remember? We do what? We do d dt, right? At t naught acting on what? Probably should erase this and give us a new picture. So here's the picture we should be thinking. Yeah? I think I should probably go. Hmm. I can watch the rest. Oh, okay. That's fine. I'll try to be not too long. I'm so sorry. Um, so DDT of. Uh, where was I? F composed with gamma, right? And so that we could write more briefly as F composed with gamma prime of T naught, right? And the beautiful thing here is that <clears throat> um, this gives us another way to calculate the differential. So trust me, this is how you want to, what was it, problem 17? Yeah. You absolutely want to do problem 17 using this formalism. Like the, the, the coordinate version is just, it's quite awful. But the, this way is not bad. And so what we have is proposition 3.24, proposition 3.24, it says the following, if we've got f from m to m smooth, right, then um, if we have, you know, gamma, a curve from j to m, all right, then here's how it goes, uh, f composed with gamma prime of t naught is equal to the differential of f acting on gamma prime of t naught. Let me, let me try to draw a picture of what's going on here. So like this is m, this is n, right? Gamma is a given curve where? A gamma is a curve given in, in M, and um, right, this is gamma. And so over here, we're looking at like F composed with gamma is over here. The image of it is. See, because F composed with gamma would take a real number, gamma takes a real number to M, and then F maps from M to N. So that is F composed of gamma. And what this is saying is that, um, you know, the, uh, so if we, if we think of like this point right here, like you can literally picture that as, you know, gamma prime of T naught. Then over here, you've got, you know, F composed with gamma prime of T naught. And that's the, that's the vector which is pushed forward from there to there under df. All right. And, and the proof is not hard. It's just like a line long. Here's how it goes. F composed of gamma prime of t naught is d of f composed with gamma, right? Acting on d dt at t naught. But what do we know about um, oh, that's kind of funny. Oof. Oof. So using this, using this for your homework, it is a little bit circular. 
because what's the necessary ingredient for this to go? Check this step out. But that's fine, we can be a little bit circular. See, he, he used the chain rule for differentials right here. <laughs> that's funny. But I think this chain, this chain rule would be easier to prove than the, um, the one in your homework. So, but you don't have to prove this chain rule. It's already been proved. So anyway, that then is literally df of this is gamma prime of t naught, which is what's claimed. So, all right, so the time has come to talk about the different viewpoints for a tangent space. So you can start to see all three viewpoints of what we've already done. We'll do more with this looking at um, a velocity vector as an equivalence class of curves. I guess I probably should actually spell it out for you guys. Um, <clears throat> well, the velocity vector is a derivation defined right here. But in particular, the way the derivation acts is you, um, whatever function you're differentiating, you compose with the curve and then you differentiate that. So like the derivative, um, the, the derivation, how do you differentiate along a curve by the velocity vector? You actually just take the function you're differentiating, compose it with the curve, and calculate the derivative of that. That's what this says. To differentiate with the velocity vector, you simply compose the function you're differentiating with the path and differentiate. So it's, it's not bad. Now, <clears throat> all right, so let me get to the point here. There are three, actually, if you study John Lee's book carefully, there are actually five, probably, different characterizations of what the tangent space is um, to, uh, to the manifold at a point. So let's talk about those different viewpoints. We already talked about this one the most, TPM, right? We could call this derivations on smooth functions of M, right? So that's our, our logically primary viewpoint. He also talks about, um, you could also talk about, this is isomorphic to, um, uh, well, let's see here how to say this. Maybe you, we could say derivations on germs. Um, or perhaps the notation derivation on C infinity P of M. And this is a kind of slippery thing. He's got a page about it where he talks about, really you can look at equivalence classes of functions, like the germ of a function. So like F is equal to G, these are germs, if and only if F of P is equal to G of P. Um, I really should say Q, F of P, Q is equal to G of Q for all Q near P. And near is more formal in the book, it's like an open set. There exists some open set such that F and G are equal on the open set. Um, I think that's how you define germ. There's that. Um, all right, so that's one viewpoint, another viewpoint. The third viewpoint um, would be it's, equal, it's isomorphic to like um, you could say a point comma you know a vector like a v1, v2, da 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 vn. You could say that a, 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 a vector is, is, is like you could identify it with or if you want me to be a little bit more, let me, let me write this, here, here's a notation that's helpful for us here. P, let me put a V vector over it, just to emphasize. I'm emphasizing that V is not an active object, V is literally just an N component vector. So this would be an element of like P Cartesian product with Rn. This is actually the oldest viewpoint, which says that a vector is just something with N components. But if you take this viewpoint, you then have to also explain how the components transform. And the rule is, it's a vector if it is, you know, n components attached to a point, 
And if you were to choose a different coordinate system, it, sat it cha satisfies the coordinate change rule we derived today. So like, in other words, P comma V um, is equivalent to P uh, comma, um, you know, V bar. I, I, I don't even have notation for it, but um, the point is, um, let me write this. This goes to, you know, P um, V bar one, V bar two, da da da, V bar n. Um, if we were to use different coordinates, and the change, the coordinate change rule for the vectors has to be the contravariant rule that we that we derived over there. This is how physicists define a vector. It's a vector is, it has n components and it transforms contravariantly. That's a vector. As a mathematician. This is a very unsatisfying definition because it, anytime you talk about a vector, every time you th prove anything about a vector, you have to prove it's invariant under coordinate change in this way. It's really a drag. Our definition that we followed John Lee, that they're just derivations on smooth functions, has the advantage of the vectors are specific concrete things, right? This is like an equivalence class of a point attached to a vector where any two vectors are related according to the coordinate change matrix that changes the coordinates. It's a mess. This is prettier. As he did, I'll let you read more about that in John Lee. That's kind of a little bit beyond our course, honestly. Um, but then the other viewpoint, which we actually would like to use on occasion, is the equivalence class of curves viewpoint. The other thing is we can say, so here's the here's, uh, equivalence class of curves. And let me just define the equivalence, all right? So here's the deal. Gamma 1 is equivalent to gamma 2 if gamma 1 of 0 is equal to gamma 2 of 0 is equal to P. All right, and we're just going to set them up so that they have to be, they have to go through the, tangent, the point of tangency at 0 just for convenience of exposition. And what else? What, what does it take, what would it take for, if you just think about the pictures I was drawing at the start of class, what should it take for the two tangent vectors to be equivalent? They have the same what? Go through the same point, they have the same what? Derivatives, right. Now we know the velocity vector of a curve, right? So it makes sense to say, you know, gamma one prime of zero equals to gamma two prime of zero. Right. We have de we've defined how to take the derivative of a curve on the manifold, on the middle board. All right. So two points are equivalent. Two vectors, two two curves are equivalent if they go through the same point, and their velocity vectors are equal at the point. Okay. Then you can look at this. Um, you know. where this is the equivalence class. So like gamma is gamma, um, you know, one equivalent to gamma. <laughs> Let me use some brackets here. Like this is, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how much you guys know about equivalence classes. Do you guys know about equivalence classes? Did you do equivalence classes in Math 200? Yes. So once you, Right, so it's, it, it is a, an equivalence class on a set is symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. The equivalence class, you take one representative, everything that's equivalent to the representative forms the class, right? These partition the sets. It, it partitions the set into disjoint, non-empty, it's disjoint, you know, disjoint, non-empty equivalence classes. So this, we can take these guys as tangent vectors. All right. It's so like the last problem I asked you guys in the homework was to state the different viewpoints for, for tangent vectors. These are the different viewpoints. You can, you can just use words. You don't have to write down notation if you want. I just want you, I want you to be aware of it. Although I, 
I think the isomorphism we're most interested in, um, I mean, we, we can write down the isomorphism from like here to here. That's pretty easy. Like what's the, I need to come up with names for these things, right? Like we can call this one like T physics. <laughs> M, <laughs> that's the physics contravariant version. And we can call this the uh, tangent space curve at M. I, I guess I should put, put, a, put a P somewhere here. We are talking about the tangent space at P, you know? So you, maybe you guys can help me out. What's the, what is the, um, What, what, what's, what's, what do you think the isomorphism is? Like if I start with, let's, let's try to find psi mapping from our, our happy-go-lucky derivations to physics. Like what do you, what do you think the isomorphism is? I, I start with my, my derivation V, how do I, I need, I need to map it to this kind of pair. I'll, 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 yeah? Big point. Big point. <laughs> So put the point there. Okay, that's part of it, and then v. But remember, it has to be a it has to be a concrete vector, right? How do we get the components of the vector, the derivation? Remember, we do what? We do like v of x1, v of x2, v of xn. That's it. And then you can prove that this map is well defined because it maps into these things in such a way that if you were to change coordinates that will change coordinates. <laughs> but sorting through what exactly it means for this map to be well defined is actually somewhat technical. What do you guys think the isomorphism should be from, let's say, the tangent space, the curve formalism, <laughs> to our regular derivation formalism? How, how's that going to go? Let me not use psi, I should use something else. We, uh, I haven't used this in a while. We'll use this guy. Whatever that is. You should do the E, but like the, um, the middle dash is not connected to the line. The E, but the middle dash is not connected to the line. It's like, it's like a futuristic font. Oh, hmm. It's like like that. All right, so. Silly, silly, silly notational um, exuberance aside, I'm supposed to map the equivalence class represented by gamma, right? So, and, and to a derivation, how do I? And, and so to define a derivation, what do you have to do? How do you define derivations? They're, they act on smooth functions of M, right? So to define this, I should really let it act on F. It has to eat a smooth function what, what's, what's, the, what's the derivation that corresponds to the equivalence class of curves? Well, the velocity vector kind of tells us what to do. See, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do like gamma prime of zero acting on F. Because we base, well, our convention is to have the curves in the tangent space at P, they all go through, um, they, all, they all go through, you know, P is gamma of zero by my, my, by my convention of equivalence class of curves. We're going to base them all at P being parameter zero for the curve puts us at P. Yeah, the domain. Now, I've just defined a map on an equivalence class. Sorry, I figured class would be over by now. Yeah, that's a reasonable assumption, <laughs> usually. Um, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm sorry, I spent 15 minutes at the start on something I regret, and so we're paying for that now. But the question then is, why is this Oh, okay. But the question is... Huh? Do, do you actually need to be somewhere? I'm reminding myself to go to something tonight, which is in an hour and a half. So not like... I had better be done in an hour and a half. <laughs> so, don't worry. I have a phone 
I will get a call before then. Um, <laughs> my daughter is also here. She wants to go home, so don't, don't worry. So to prove that this mapping that I need not be named is well defined, what do you have to do? If you're defining a function on an equivalence class, you're obligated to show that the mapping, the rule for the mapping is independent of the representative that you've used. Right? So what if we have gamma 1 equal to gamma 2, right? So on the one hand, we'd have, uh, you know, this maps gamma 1 to what? When that acts on f, you've got gamma 1 prime of 0 acting on f, right? Yes. But on the other hand, or you could just, we could, we could forego the f and just say this, right? Fine. We don't need to put the f there if we don't want to. And on the other hand, if we let this act on gamma 2, what do we got? Prime of 0. And if those were not equal, this would not be a function because it would not be single valued. However, what does it mean for these equivalence classes to be equal? Yeah. That means that the derivatives are zero. Right, the derivatives are match. At the, yeah. So in particular, this and that are equal. Don't be fooled, these are derivations. All right, this is not something we did in calculus three. But they have to be equal by assumption of the definition of the equivalence. So this is actually the isomorphism. The thing that's kind of nefarious is, and this is weird, like if you ask me, come up with an example where you've got a vector space, but it's hard to define the vector addition. That's kind of a hard thing to do, right? Can you think of any vector spaces where the vector addition isn't just kind of like, duh, like matri a space of matrices? How, what's the vector addition? You add component-wise, right? Column vectors, what's the vector addition? You add component-wise. Function space, what's the vector addition? Point-wise addition of functions, right? Go down the list. Like The definition of addition for a vector space in almost every example I can ever think of is mind-numbingly, stupidly simple. With that set up, you guys tell me, how do I add two equivalence classes of curves? Add the equivalence Well, their equivalence classes, I'm telling you that this is isomorphic to the vector space of derivations. If it's isomorphic as a vector space, there has to be a vector addition for the equivalence classes of curves. How do you do that? How do you add them? Yeah. <laughs> the union? No, it's not the union. <laughs> you guys are cracking me up. So, you know, I mean, it's... It, <laughs> all right, so let me, let's define it. Here we go, check this out. So if we want to say gamma 1 plus, uh, you know, gamma 2. Are we assuming that these are in the same equivalence class? Yeah, these are both elements of the equi equivalence class of curves based at P. Oh, they got to both be based at P. These are not equivalent, no. Sorry. Do you want me to use a different letter? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so let's say uh, uh, there. Add this equivalence class and that. They're both 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 based at p. All right. It's so like gamma of zero is p, phi of zero is p. They're both equivalence classes based at p. Okay. How would I? So you're trying to find an equivalence class. What? How do you, I mean, this is equal to what? <laughs> you know, like what? Let me, let me use a different letter, alpha. How do you, what, what's the equivalence class which? I don't know what that's asking. I'm asking that you've got M, here's the point P, right? You've got one equivalence class, which we could call the equivalence class represented by gamma. I'm just going to draw a single equivalence because otherwise it's kind of like the picture gets too cloudy. I've got another equivalence class, phi, right? Those represent vectors, right? Like we can draw a picture kind of geometrically. I mean, this is a schema. This is, of course, just a mnemonic. But that, like that vector, right? And the the purple one, 
has got some vector like that, right? The question is, how do you come up with a third curve, you know, alpha, such that this guy is the linear combination of that and that? My picture's obviously not helpful, but maybe if I make this, if I make this one go the other way, you can kind of see it. <laughs> Let me just, for, for my own, so like, think about, like, this plus that is the black one, you know? <laughs> So here's how I'd do it. Given what we have on the board, I think I can get away with this. I know how to add derivations. Do you guys know how to did add derivations? How do you add derivations? They're functions on smooth functions, right? Like a derivation, it, it takes in a smooth function and outputs a number, but it is itself a function of smooth functions. So if I add two functions, I just do it pointwise. So to add two derivations, I just add them in terms of their point-wise um, operation. So I know, I know how to add derivations. I know that this is an isomorphism, if you believe me. So that means it has an inverse. So what I can then do is just say that, um, basic, basically just take psi of this thing, right? Oh, did I call this psi? Well, whatever this thing is, the hieroglyphic of this, right, should be equal to of that. Um, so this is going to give me gamma prime of zero plus phi prime of zero, right? And Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so, but, but basically, um, well, f this is an isomorphism, so that's hieroglyphic of that plus hieroglyphic of that, which is this. But I'm really interested in what that is. So apparently what that is, is hieroglyphic inverse of this. So you just, you know, Now that that's not actually what I do. That's not how I usually do it either. That's a really weird way to look at it. What I usually do, and what um, what's his name, what John Lee does, is he trades. Basically, looks at the coordinate. If I can draw a picture. So up here you got m, right? Here's gamma. So there's a point here where we can think about like v in the tangent space at p and m, so to speak, right? Uh, what's that? <laughs> TPM trusted platform module. Ah, That has that joke has an audience, but it's not me, um, <laughs> for sure. So that's fine. I mean, I'm certainly guilty of that. I can't can't deny you guys. All right. So you, the point is, if we look at, um, so basically, just focus. You can narrow the range of gamma so that it fits inside a chart domain, right? Like, there's no loss of. You can always like narrow the domain of gamma so it's just basically to like plus or minus epsilon of the p, like that. And if you do that, then well, there's a corresponding there's a corresponding like little curve down here, right, where it's got x of p, right. So this thing down here we could call gamma hat. So like gamma hat um, of t is something like um, 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 uh, sorry uh, n n n n no 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 uh, uh, I I'll, I'll get it eventually x of um, 
x of, um, sorry, brain not working entirely, x of, x of p, okay, x of p, um, sorry, my bad, x of gamma of t, yeah. So, like, basically, the image of that curve, like, there's a curve up here, right? Like, I've drawn up there. So that maps under x to this. Notice that, like, gamma hat of 0 is x of gamma of 0, which is x of p, right? And um, so there is a there's a line down here like gamma hat i can i can trade for like l of t equal to x of p plus t times the vector v1 v2 vn um where I'm actually thinking of, you know, V up here, as usual, being VI partial partial XI. So, like, I can use, I can use these components to build a direction vector. And, like, if you sort through it, the push forward, the push forward of this vector down to that point, it will point in this direction. That's basic, like he talks about this in terms of identifications, but long story short, if I have a line, let me just summarize. If I have a curve up here, I can find a line down here whose direction vector is literally obtained in the direction of the push forward of the vector up here down to there. So if I have two curves, if I've got a gamma and a, and a phi, right, I have, I can, I can take like this one vector here with 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 the v direction and if i've got you know this one like this let's say phi well then i can i've got a, a line down here i can call phi hat so I, like you know the line in the gamma direction the line in the phi direction and that will be x of p plus t times you know w1 wn or w1 through wn are the components of um so I'm sorry, I, I'm defining how you would map a derivation, but if you can map a derivation, you can map a lot. So like, just think of this as being phi prime of zero. Uh, think, think of this as being the gamma prime of zero, okay? That's the other thought I'm missing. So gamma prime of zero can be written, it's a derivation, so it can be expanded in the basis, remember we proved its basis, so there exists v1 through vn, whose linear combination of the partial derivatives, the coordinate basis, will give us back gamma prime of zero. So that gives me a vector up here, and the, with components v1 through vn. I take those, and I can set up a vector down in Rn, which literally has the push forward of the, the vector, the derivation upstairs down to there. And I can do the same for the other equivalence class. See, I can say w is equal to phi prime of zero, right? And that will have components w1 through wn. And so I can push forward that down, and that will give me like a direction, give me a, you know, a vector here like that, let's say. And then I can write down this line, right? And then finding a line whose direction vector is the sum of these two is as simple as adding the direction vectors. You know how to add these. So it's anything that maps to, that x maps uh, from some point p um, to, like, that passes through um, the same point as gamma of t or Yeah. So my, my point is there's a natural correspondence between the equivalence classes of curves and corresponding lines in the, you know, x of u. So we know how to add direction vectors for these lines, just concrete vector addition. So I basically take these down here, add them, go back up. And that gives me a way of adding equivalence classes of curves. <coughs> 